This video looks at what a geodesic is given some manifold, as well as one method by which it can be derived. It particularly focuses on how the geodesic equation is used in the theory of general relativity to describe the motion of objects in space-time. So a geodesic generalizes our familiar idea of a straight line in Euclidean geometry to curved spaces. So in flat Euclidean space, a geodesic is just a straight line whose tangent vector points in the same direction as it is parallel transported along the length of the, the straight line. So in curved spaces, a geodesic is a curve whose tangent vectors also remain parallel to each other as they are transported along the curve. And we'll see an example of this shortly. So in general relativity, all objects not subject to non-gravitational forces travel along geodesics. That is, all freely falling objects move along geodesics. So on the sphere, geodesics take the form of great circles. And there's two shown in the diagram here, the blue one and the red one. These great circles all share the same diameter. Uh, they all share the same centre, which is the centre of the sphere. And um, just consider also in, uh, in flat space, Euclidean space, geodesics are just straight lines, which are also the shortest distance between two points. On the sphere, curved surface, the geodesics are the great circles. All right, so here's some manifold. We have a curve on it in blue. Marked here in blue is our curve on the manifold, and this curve is parameterized in terms of the variable lambda. So for each component, we're going to have each component is a function of lambda, x mu of lambda. So mu in general relativity goes from 0, 1, 2, 3. So there's four components for a vector in four space, a four, a four vector in Space time on the space time manifold has four components. All right. Now, the tangent vector shown here in red is the tangent to this curve, and we'll have a look at that how, how we start with the coordinates here and the derivative of those with respect to the lambda with respect to the variable para parameter lambda will give us the tangent vector components, which we'll see shortly. So, there's an image of what it is. So, here's our manifold, here's the curve, here's the tangent to the curve. All right, so we're looking for some geodesics, x mu of lambda, whose tangent vector has a fixed direction along this curve. And these are the components of the vector that describes the position of some object. So the tangent vector t is given by this here. Here's the components, here's the basis vectors, and these uh, tangent components here are the derivatives with respect to lambda of this object here for each of the mu and expanded that out. So that'll give us a tangent vector. For whatever manifold in whatever dimension we're dealing with, whether it's four dimensions of space-time or some n-dimensional manifold, if it's an n-dimensional manifold then mu will go up to n and there'll be n number of components for this object. So a condition that satisfies this requirement, that is the tangent vector has a fixed direction along this curve, is dt, the derivative of the lambda with respect to, derivative of the tangent, sorry, vector with respect to the parameter lambda is this object here. Now this condition keeps the tangent parallel to itself, but does allow for changes in the length of the tangent vector, or the magnitude of the tangent vector, since k does not have to equal 1. So this keeps the derivative of this parallel to this, but its magnitude can vary. Now in general relativity, geodesics are the paths followed by objects for which the tangent vector is the four velocity of the object. Now the magnitude of this tangent vector, this four velocity, is a constant. So if we do the scalar product here, we'll get a constant. So that means the magnitude is not varying. So the condition that requires, this condition requires that the tangent vector be parallel transported in such a way that it remains constant in both direction and magnitude. So we must have the derivative of the tangent vector with respect to the, lambda, the parameter lambda, the total derivative, the intrinsic derivative, is zero. Okay, so we now have dt d lambda is d d lambda of the tangent vector, components and the basis vector here. And that means the derivative of the components times the basis vector plus the component times the derivative of the basis vector. If you have a look here, here we go, dt mu d lambda times e. Now over here, the derivative of the basis vector can be written as this partial derivative with respect to the coordinates times dx mu d lambda, which is the tangent vector. We'll see that on the next page.
Here we are. Total derivative is this object here again, and we can write that as this object over here. Now, the partial derivative of the basis vector with respect to the coordinates gives us this Christoffel symbol of the second kind times the basis vector. All right, um, this dx nu d lambda, that's just the tangent vector again. So with the index nu, uh, here's the tangent vector components again, t with the index mu. All right, so next line down, we can write that. What we can do here is we can factor out, we can factor out the basis vectors, e mu, and what we can do is, if you notice here, this mu and this mu, this alpha and this alpha, they can swap places. They're dummy indices. We're free to name whatever we like. So we can have this alpha can swap with a mu, this alpha with a mu here, and we end up with E subscript mu basis vector, and over here E subscript mu basis vector again. All right, and we can factor that out. And that's what we've done down here. Next line down here. Factor that out. Here we are. Here's our object. Now, we can replace the tangent vector index, uh, tangent vector component, sorry, back with its original derivative, dx lambda d uh, dx alpha d lambda times dx nu d lambda. Now, remember our condition was that this derivative, the tangent vector with respect to lambda, was zero. And so what we have, this leads to the geodesic equation. This object here is now equal to zero in order to make this statement true. And notice here dt mu d lambda. Well, t mu can be replaced with dx mu d lambda. And then another d lambda that gives us the second derivative. So here we have now the geodesic equation, starting with our original coordinates x mu on the manifold, and solve this, and we will end up with the equation of motion of the particle. So this gives us the equation of motion of a free particle, not not subject to any forces, freely following the curvature of space time or freely falling. And here is its equation of motion. Now, the solution to the geodesic equation in dimensional space is n differential equations. Now, the most commonly used parameter for a massive particle is the proper time tau, as measured by a clock carried along with the particle. And another thing to note is that any parameter lambda that is related to the proper time tau by way of the transformation tau is replaced with lambda plus a tau plus b, where a and b are constants, also satisfies the geodesic equation. And these parameters are called affine parameters. Under this transformation, the geodesic equation is given by, still given in the same form. All right, now earlier we found that dt to lambda was this object. Okay, now this also leads to, we're just going to look at another way of rewriting all this now, but we can, instead of that long expression we had before, well, it wasn't terribly long, but we can also write it in another more compact way. So. The derivative of the components with respect to lambda is this object here we found earlier. That's just from up here, just put the two uh, tangent components together next to each other. And we can write that like that, this in, in that way. All right, and here we go. Now notice here this dt mu d lambda can be written as dt mu dx alpha, dx alpha d lambda, just the chain rule in operation here. When we do that, we get dt mu dx alpha times t alpha plus all this. Well, we can factorize out a t alpha here, there, and there. Factorize it out here. And this becomes, this bit in the bracket here, becomes the derivative, the um, covariant derivative of the components. Here it is, that object there is this object, times or dotted with the scalar product with the tangent vector itself. So this is the derivative of the tangent vector in the direction of the tangent vector and as we know from earlier, that is equal to zero. So here we go. So geodesic curves are solutions to this equation. And that just means that the covariant derivative of the tangent vector in the direction of the tangent vector, so here we have the directional derivative, is equal to zero. And t mu is just dx mu d lambda. Now next thing, let's have a look at the geodesic of a charged particle. So we have a charged particle experiencing an electromagnetic force. We'll follow a path diff to a, uh, a different path to a freely falling one. And the force it experiences is given by the time rate of change in momentum with respect to the proper time. is m0 times the time rate of change of the fall, fall velocity of the particle, u. 
with respect to, to tau the proper time. And that'll be Q, the charge, times the electromagnetic tensor, F, dotted with the uh, four velocity of the particle. All right. Now, P is the form momentum, and F is the electromagnetic field, electromagnetic field tensor of rank 2. We're just going over. So in component form, this equation is M0, the rest mass of the object. I should say it, M subscript 0 is the rest mass in, in all these videos. Um, partial derivative, of, uh, sorry, the derivative of the um, four velocity components with respect to the proper time of the particle is equal to this object here. Notice there's one index raised there, the mu index raised. Right now, the electromagnetic field tensor with both covariant indices is expressed in this form. Obviously, we can multiply by the metric to raise indices and so on. Right, the four velocity of this particle given, so the four velocity here, this object here, is in component form times the basis vectors here, or this derivative here times that. Now, let's work our way through this. Rest mass, m0, du d tau is this object here. Now, this is the derivative of the four velocity with respect to proper time tau. That's the time measured by a by the particle carrying its own clock, or measured by the clock that the particle carries along with it. And expand it out, so we have the derivative of the components, u mu, times the basis vector, plus the component times the derivative of the basis vector. And again, as we saw earlier, let's work our way through here using the chain rule in this part here, which is the same as this object here. Same thing. We go down. Now, this partial derivative of the basis vector will give us this Christoffel symbol of the second kind times this basis vector here. Everything else is the same otherwise from the previous line. All right. Next line down, what we're going to do is we want to factor out, we want to factor out the basis vector. So we need to chain. We've got E subscript mu here. We've got E subscript gamma. Well, this gamma and this gamma can be swapped with this mu and this mu. It doesn't matter what we label things, uh, they're dummy indices, we're free to replace them or call them whatever we want. In this case, we just want to swap them so that we can factor out E subscript mu. So we get that. There we go. And next line down, we've taken the basis vector outside, and we have inside the brackets here are the components of this derivative. Just rearranging those slightly and replacing U superscript gamma there with dx gamma d tau, which, is, which are its components. On the manifold, x mu, the derivative with respect to proper time tau, will give us that four velocity component. So here we are, and over here, replace u, the uh, superscript mu, with uh, x mu d tau, d d tau of x mu. So we get this second derivative here, and you can see that the um, geodesic equation is shaping up again. All right, so this gives the following equation of motion for the charged particle is this object here. Now what we can do is divide through by the rest mass and underneath. Over here on the right, we have Q is the charge of the particle, whatever charged particle it is, um, electron, proton, whatever uh, charged uh, atom, what have you, charged nucleus, what have you. So that's the total charge there of the object we're concerned with. Uh, Rank two electromagnetic tensor F here and the four velocity component here. So that's the geodesic equation of a particle which is subject to an electromagnetic force only and no, no other forces. And again, in n dimensional space, it will produce n differential equations. In four dimensional space time, it will produce four equations, four differential equations that need to be solved. And that's it.